London in the late 16th and early 17th centuries was the home of a vibrant theatrical culture. The elements of Shakespearean London theatres explore that world as it was 400 years ago and as it is today. We started the project out of a feeling that not enough is known by many people about what was happening in the theatre world of London apart from the Globe. Everybody knows the Globe story and perhaps knows a bit about the nearby Rose Theatre. But in fact, there were dozens of places in London that theatre was taking place before Shakespeare arrived in London and in the decades after um, he left. And it's that whole story, so it's the whole period and the whole collection of theatres we wanted to tell people about. There were six things we're doing on this project. The first is a free walking map. So we are giving away uh, a map showing where these sites are in London and guiding you around them and giving an indication of how long each walk would take. It's not just theatre sites, we can show you where there are churches, where actors of the period are buried, and places like the Revels office, where play scripts were taken to be licensed before they could be performed. So we have a map, which is free. We have a guide book, which is a uh, low price, but it's an enhanced version. It includes the map at the back, and we'll tell you more about each location you're taken to. The third output is a smartphone app. We have essentially the same thing as the map, but in digital form for your Android or Apple phone. Because your phone knows where you are on the ground and knows which way you're pointed, our app can guide you to these sites, and when you get there, it, can tell you, it will tell you um, text about them. You can read about the locations. You can see pictures of the locations as they are now, as they were then. The fourth is a series of talks at the v &A, the Victoria and Albert Museum, where you can hear theatre historians Leading historians, world-class historians, will come and tell you about each of the um, venues or plays that, that they're interested in to give you the whole picture of theatre in this period. We also, of course, have an interactive website that um, people can get all of our materials from. And the last output is an hour of documentary film, of which this forms a part. In the years between the setting up of the first permanent London playhouses and their closure just over 60 years later at the start of the Civil War, theatre in the capital underwent rapid and remarkable change. Over the 50 years from the 1580s to the 1630s, in a word what happens to theatre is it becomes respectable, having started out as an extremely disreputable uh, occupation, it becomes highly reputable. The key change is in the 1550s and 1560s, the state, the crown, the monarchy gets involved and essentially forces this industry to become um, more organised. It, it becomes required that actors have to have an aristocratic patron and essentially they have to acquire capital. That's the way I look at it. So that those who don't have capital are forced out of the business and the few that do and can accumulate capital um, become rather successful but they are still essentially touring companies. The point about um, the theatre going commercial was the key thing that allowed it to develop. Um, I mean, in a, in a marketplace, you were totally dependent on just taking a hat around and asking people to, to be generous enough to give money in return for the pleasure the actors were giving them. Um, so the first commercial theatres of, of, of 1575 and 1576 were built with a wall around the stage. And of course, being a big wall, they'd put two or three ranks of galleries up on each side, so you had ample space. Um, and you didn't get into the theatre unless you paid. Although if you plot these locations on a map, what you'll spot is that they're on the periphery of old London, not in the centre. And that's an interesting question for theatre historians. What exactly was going on in relation to the very wealthy centre of London? And the short answer is uh, the theatre people were kept out from the middle. But they wanted to work in the middle. The actors were very keen to get close to their most wealthy audiences, right in the heart of London. So there's, essentially there's a struggle between the actors and the two forces with which they have to contend. Mainly the opposition between the government or Privy Council and the Lord Mayor of London, who was dead against plays and did all he could to block them. I mean, bu bureaucracy is the real underlying story in all of this. Um, the bureaucratic conflict there meant that suddenly all the actors were stopped from acting at the inns inside the city and had to act out in the suburbs. And that meant also that the only theatres in the suburbs were the open-air amphitheatres, the big open-air amphitheatres. 
The commercialization of theatre, which really started in 1575 and 1576, when the first indoor playhouses opened um, for, for profit making, and the um, first outdoor amphitheatre, the, 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 the precursor of the globe, the theatre, was built in, uh, by James Burbage in 1576. A key date for us here is 1594. In 94, um, the Privy Council orders that there will be just two theatre companies in London and they have the sole right to play um, in London. No one else can. They have what is sometimes called a duopoly, a monopoly of two. Th those involved in those two companies, the Lord uh, Admiral's men and the Lord Chamberlain's men, become very rich very quickly because of this um, sole access to London and also because they were very good. I mean, it, they were huge, it was a hugely profit-making business. And the real profiteers were the, uh, the owners of the playhouses, renting them out to the actors. The actors took, took their share, but the, the owners always took half of the gallery profits, which is the most expensive part of the theatre. So they always made a fair share. More than a third of the takings always went to the owners rather than to the, to the actors. And in the case of the Lord Chamberlain's men, they had a very good actor who was also writing plays for them, William Shakespeare. The other company tended to rely more on freelance writers, but they had the scripts of Christopher Barlow to begin with. And these companies um, performed at two open-air amphitheatres, one south of the river, the Rose, the other north of the river, the theatre. And they stayed put. That was a new development. The actors previously had always tended to move around the country, or if they were in London, move between venues. But this 1594 Privy Council order made them stay put. They had to stay in their own theatre, which was something new for the audiences. And if they liked the lead actor, whose name was Richard Burbage, son of James Burbage, who built the first theatre, if they liked what he did, they could come back each day and see another play, because the repertory had a very fast turnover. They had a new play every day, more or less, in a cycle. You might have to wait four or five days to see your favourite come back again. And the same thing was happening south of the river with Edward Alain, the lead actor of the Lord Admiral's Men. When the Lord Chamberlain's men um, moved their theatre from Shoreditch down to south of London in um, the Bankside region and re-erected it as the newly built Globe, they were only 100 or 2 yards away from the Rose Theatre, owned by Philip Henslow. We don't know how Philip Henslow reacted to this, but he cannot have been pleased to have his main rival company on his doorstep. We do know for sure that the very next thing Henslow did was erect a new theatre for himself north of the river. So essentially the two companies swapped sides. In uh, Golding Lane, Henslow built the Fortune Theatre and its contract explicitly described it as being modelled on the globe. With one exception, rather than being roughly circular, this new Fortune Theatre was square. The amphitheatre um, style playhouses on the edges of London were new builds. These were buildings where there had been fields before. You couldn't build such a thing in the middle of London, but in the middle of London was where the actors wanted to be because that is where the most affluent customers lived and worked. And part of their struggle with um, the London Corporation was about whether playing would be tolerated right in the heart of London, inside the old city wall. In the 1590s, the Lord Chamberlain's men could see the closing of the theatre. They could see that their theatre in Shoreditch needed to um, either have a new lease or to be moved. And they had a brilliant idea for a new theatre. They managed to acquire part of an old Blackfriars monastery in the Blackfriars district, Blackfriars being an order of monks, and converted that into a theatre, an indoor theatre. So they took an existing building and made it into a theatre rather than building something new. The Blackfriars very quickly became the most fashionable site in London. Everybody who was rich and had expensive costumes would come and flaunt them in the audience uh, at the Blackfriars. And, it, and even Queen Henrietta Maria, Charles's Queen, went four times to the Blackfriars for an ordinary play. And for a Queen actually to go to a theatre, instead of having the theatre come to her, which is what Elizabeth always insisted on. That was extraordinary and, and, and quite radical. And that was the beginning of the great change in which the Globe, which was the most popular playhouse when it was first built in 1600, 1599, 1600, was gradually superseded by the Blackfriars because um, summer and winter uh, 
They, I mean, it was incredibly self-indulgent of the company to have two playhouses and only use one of them. But they used the Globe in the summer because it was outdoors and you could get a much bigger crowd in. Um, and the Blackfriars in, as an indoor venue through the winter. So, um, in effect, the whole of, of acting went up market quite drastically. And the rich and the famous, of course, all wanted to be indoors. So only the indoor theatre survived after 1660. And one might actually see in this the origin of an idea about theatre that we still have, as it being a preserve of the, the well-off and the educated. It started, of course, in our period as entertainment for the working class.